And first edition, the Greens spokesperson on uranium matters and on defence, Senator Scott Ludlam. Senator Ludlam, thanks for your time. India already has enough uranium to stock its nuclear warheads. This is about, isn't this about providing a country which needs energy with, well, the, with the supply of uranium, of course, which Australia has a lot of? It's, it's partly that. But the uranium supply that India has domestically is quite low grade and it's depleting quite rapidly. And I visited that area. Um, some time ago now. So what it appears is happening is the Indian government is moving to secure foreign sources of uranium like Australia's, which they've been banned from doing historically, so that they can reserve their own domestic sources for plutonium production for weapons. And there are Indian officials on the record saying that that's the strategy. So no safeguards agreement in the world is going to be able to prevent that kind of behaviour. But, but in, in that context, isn't this a case where India will do this regardless of whether we cooperate or not, they're going to have nuclear weapons regardless of whether we supply it or not. Would you prefer them to provide energy to hundreds of millions of people using coal? No. Dirty can we please get away from the argument that it's either coal or uranium? I don't know uh, why we're persisting with that. The Indian solar industry has finally hit its straps and I think that is the kind of export deal that we could get behind in the Australian Greens. Um, the renewable energy industry um, in India in particular, solar and micro hydro, has vastly more potential to provide electricity. Uh, energy to people, particularly in dispersed regional communities, the nukes ever will. We've got to get beyond it's either the coal miners or the uranium but, but, but miners. But renewable benefit. energy is not going to light the homes of 400 million Indians, is you it? You watch. The Indian solar industry quite seriously is just is finally scaling up as it is elsewhere around the world. And I think, you know, after uh, what have they been at it, 30 or 40 years in India with nukes, they're supplying less than 4% of domestic electricity supply. So I think this is about Australian uranium mining interests trumping uh, national security, firstly, and the safety of the communities who have to live around those power stations. But the reason I raise the coal issue is because, as you know, the vast bulk of, of energy in India is currently through coal-fired power stations. Yeah. And if you want to lift these hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, surely you need another base load power ready to go now to do that. Yeah, and the, the Greens would want them, you know, yeah, of course. hundreds of millions of people to have their of homes lit. But when you look at the at the mechanics of the Indian electricity distribution system, it's not like Australia's. You've got the big cities and the industrial areas, but hugely dispersed regional populations that baseload coal and nuke generators are never going to serve. They just never have in the past. So smaller scale dispersed renewables are what will actually light these villages up. And we're also seeing now um, baseload solar plants that are able to scale up to serve big industrial centres. So I think nukes are on the way out. The industry's in crisis and has been for a while. Let's look at uh, Iraq now. A general request for military assistance has been yep. issued by the United States. Uh, the United Nations is calling on the international community to put uh, a united front to take on the Islamic State terrorists. Uh, it, it seems the Greens are among a very small minority opposed to uh, a coalition in Iraq. Uh, no, we welcome those comments by the Secretary General because they indicate that it's likely now that a UN Security Council resolution is afoot. We want Australia to be um, a part of that, given that we have a seat on the Security Council. What we've objected to and will continue to strongly object to is a blank cheque for military intervention with no plan, no strategy, no diplomatic outcome. Uh, and no uh, Security Council resolution and no vote in the Australian Parliament. Isn't the outcome a humanitarian outcome in the short term? Well, it, dropping, it's, it's dropping hard to get all, all of those boxes ticked while still stopping what is obviously a very sure. mobile and effective operation there. Sure. Um, I, think, I don't think anybody opposes humanitarian intervention at all. We certainly haven't heard any of that in the last week or two. Uh, what we are very, very cautious of, though, is an open-ended military commitment that the Abbott government appears to be taking us into, because that is what got us into this mess in the first place, which has been ruinous for the people of Iraq. So what we want to see is what is, what is the plan for cutting funding off to the Islamic State, for example, from, from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, countries that are allies of Australia, What's the plan for closing the border that these people are crossing into Iraq from Turkey and elsewhere? And what's the plan for a lasting stability in Iraq? Rather than simply arming one side, what it's strongly recalling for us is the US arming uh, the Mujahideen because they were fighting the Soviets in, in Afghanistan. That group then mutated into the Taliban and turned those weapons on US uh, and, and the Australians and the Afghan population. Uh, it's tremendously complicated and what we are very concerned about is simply rushing headlong into military intervention without a plan. Senator Ludlam, thanks for your time. Thank you.